Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from Dr. Lillis's lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's an author of several books, including Hidden Mountain's Secret Garden, A Theological Contemplation on Prayer, and Fire from Above, Christian Contemplation and Mystical Wisdom. In this particular series of conversations, We'll focus on the spiritual writings of St. Teresa of Avila, and in particular, her autobiography. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We now continue with part two of our conversation. So she will move forward in her reflection on this. Where do we go from here? I kind of mentioned this earlier. This moment is profound. It's the beginning of a whole bunch of a whole range of moments, a whole range of conversions that happen for her. It's the one sure foothold, rather, that she has that helps her make progress forward. And she will now find more footholds. The next foothold that is also described in this chapter, it's so rich with the experiences that she gives, is she reads St. Augustine's Confessions. And just like her encounter with Jesus through the statue that brought her to tears, where the statue put her face to face with Jesus who suffered for her sake, so too when she reads St. Augustine's Confessions, and the passage that she's describing is chapter 8, or book 8 rather, of the Confessions. In book 8 of the Confessions, St. Augustine, up until this point of his life, he has been wrestling with being chased. He went through a incredible journey intellectually where he tried a whole bunch of different spiritualities. He had been a catechumen since his youth, but he wasn't baptized because he and really his parents were afraid that if you, if you got baptized, then you would have to live a really good life. And he just didn't think he was going to be that virtuous. So he thought he'd wait like his father did till his death better to get baptized so that he wouldn't have to be that virtuous. In the meantime, though, that kind of spirituality where you're putting God on hold, it's not very satisfying for the soul. And so he goes on a spiritual journey and he deals with the Manichees and the astrologers and all these different teachers and so forth looking for the truth. And he finally finds it. He's with a group of friends He's listening to the preaching of St. Ambrose. He's listening to some of the great thinkers of his time who are converting and becoming Catholic. And then he hears about the conversion of Antony in the desert. Athanasius' Life of Antony had been published a few years before, and it was sweeping the empire. What was fascinating, the reason why so many Romans were captivated by the book of St. Antony's life was that Antony, rather than trying to strive for earthly goods, renounces everything to follow the Lord. That following the Lord, putting your faith first, is the most important thing you can do in life. That is what is going to give you meaning. And so this sweeps Augustine's household. They're all reading it and they're starting to convert. And Augustine reads it and his complaint is, he goes, the people who are converting and Antony himself, these are people who are not as educated as me. They don't know culture as well as me. They haven't thought things through as well as I have. And yet they're risking everything to follow God and finding happiness and peace and joy in it. Why can't I do this? And he realizes why he can't do it. The reason why he can't make that move, that move of obedience of faith, is that he can't imagine being chaste. Chastity is his wound. How can I be chaste? He's drawn by chastity, and he's attracted to it, and he loves what Christianity promises. But he just can't see how he can live it and be happy. And he's afraid if he tries it, he's going to fail. And so there's fear, there's a lack of confidence, and yet there's this 
dynamic power attracting him. It's the power of the virginal manhood of Jesus that's drawing St. Augustine. He doesn't even realize it. He's in a garden and he realizes the only way he can follow Jesus is if he's given some kind of gift. And so he calls out, you know, begging God to give him the gift of conversion. Give me the gift to renounce my way of life, to renounce my lack of chastity so that I can follow you and live a beautiful and meaningful life. I don't like my life. It's not meaningful. I want to live a meaningful life, but I can't do it on my own. And he he literally is pulling his hair out. And it's there where he hears a voice. He discerns eventually it's the voice of Christ, this voice of a little boy telling him to pick up and read. And he remembers that there's a book in his house. It's it's the Bible. And he goes into his house and he opens it to Romans chapter 13. It says, Make no provision for the flesh. Instead, put on Jesus Christ. And he said, I read those words as I picked up the scriptures and I read those words. I did not need to read any further. For the light of God's confidence flooded my soul. And there's a definitive moment where Augustine all of a sudden has the courage to be chaste. He didn't have it before, but now he does. Teresa is reading this very story that I just told you. Teresa's reading this and she's thinking about the experience she's had in front of the statue and how Jesus touched her heart, and how much Jesus has loved her. And by this time, she's spent some time in mental prayer, in trying to picture the face of Jesus alone in the garden. She's turned her heart back to prayer, but she's struggling. And then she reads this witness of St. Augustine in the Confessions, and the gift of tears that she had at the moment she saw the statue returns to her. And she realizes how completely reliant she is on Christ. But because she's reliant on Christ, she can do this. God is going to accomplish it in her. The second set of tears are very, very important. They show the trajectory that conversion isn't this one-time emotional response, but it's a pathway. You take one step in love and confidence and another step in love and confidence and another step and pretty soon You're making progress on a lifelong journey. And that's what we see in this chapter. Wow, that is so powerful. That particular witness of not only her, but of also St. Augustine. It's kind of breathtaking to think that so many others would pick up her work and her life and experience that same type of power, that same type of grace. Right off the top of my head, I'm thinking of Teresa Benedict of the Cross, Edith Stein, and how that was a great impetus for her as well. It's that witness. It's such a tender but such an important thing that we have to share with one another, isn't it? Oh, I absolutely agree with you. What we get to see in this chapter, of course, is kind of I I don't really know what to call it other than the inheritance of the saints. One saint influences another, influences another, influences another. We have the life of Anthony because St. Athanasius sat at his feet and as a young man learned these stories. And then Athanasius becomes a bishop for a little while, one of the few voices in the whole church that was holding fast the faith. Everybody else was duped. But to encourage people to live the spiritual life, he tells the stories of his spiritual father. In fact, he's asked by other monks to tell us the stories of your spiritual father. So Athanasius writes about St. Anthony. These monks view Athanasius as their spiritual father. Athanasius views as Anthony as his. Well, this lineage of spiritual fatherhood, this patrimony, Uh, is passed on to St. Augustine, and St. Augustine has passed it on to countless souls through his confessions, including St. Teresa of Avila. And St. Teresa of Avila here finds a kind of certitude that this this grace she had is not simply an emotional moment, it's not a figment in her imagination, it's not a passing thing. This roots your life in deep meaning if you will 
persevere and allow it to. And because she did it, Chris, just what you're saying, all these Carmelite saints that we know of today, doctors of the church, Therese of Lisieux is there, but you know other doctors of the church, John of the Cross, will we see Teresa Benedicta of the Cross declared a doctor of the church? We just might. What about Elizabeth of the Trinity? We just might. There's a spiritual heritage, a spiritual body of teaching, of confidence in the love of God and what he can do in the soul that runs through their teaching that has been influencing saints and mystics through the centuries, really millennia. So now in this show, as we're talking about it, Chris, these witnesses are touching even more. Yeah, you just have to let the saints speak. What they have to share with us I'm so glad you brought up Elizabeth of the Trinity. Just as she was trying to pass that on to her sister, Marguerite, just as Therese was outlining her experience because her sister thought it was important that she write all these things down. And look at the, the fruitfulness, this type of sharing, not to their greatness or their accomplishment, but what he is doing. I think that's what makes it so authentic. It's not about what they did as much as what he did in them. And that's what they're witnessing to, right? That's right. One final kind of distinction to make that I think is important when we talk about this grace, it can be misunderstood to be looked at as a kind of consolation. You gain confidence because of this emotional outpouring that you have or these spiritual feelings that you get. Those things do happen. They have their own place. But Teresa of Avila in this chapter, she kind of ends it saying, don't seek those things. What you want is the grace of conversion. You want to not backslide anymore. You want to be devoted to Christ Jesus. If he gives you feelings and emotions and intuitions and insights, all the better. Praise God for those gifts. But let him give those to you when he wants and how he wants. Our job is to turn our hearts towards him, to welcome his word, regardless of the way we feel or don't feel, regardless of what we understand or don't understand, we want to turn towards him. And so when we use the methods that she talked about in this chapter, where whether it's reading a spiritual book or picturing Jesus in our imagination or praying in front of a statue, avail our heart to very powerful graces because of our love and the faith that we have. But the graces that we receive sometimes have very little to do with the emotions that we experience. And we shouldn't get discouraged if we don't feel things when we pray this way. Instead, we should be begging God for the changes in our life that give evidence to us that he is really and truly there. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app where you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Monsignor John Essif, Deacon James Keating, Father Donald Haggerty, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. They're all available on the free Discerning Hearts app. Over 3,000 spiritual formation programs and prayers, all available to you with no hidden fees or subscriptions. Did you also know that you can listen to Discerning Hearts programming wherever you download your favorite podcasts? like Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, even on Audible, as well as numerous other worldwide podcast streaming platforms. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has a YouTube channel? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts Catholic Podcasts dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. A Prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all that I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love, 
and your grace, that is enough for me. Amen. Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. For those who are reading along with us, the last two paragraphs I think are very interesting. As you were alluding to in what you just said, she talks about, I would not beseech him to give me tenderness of devotion. Never would I have dared to do that. I only begged him to pardon my great sins and to give me the grace not to offend him. And it's changed. She's not demanding, like you said, the consolations, give me the, the, the good feelings. Just pardon me. Just forgive me when I mess up and show me mercy, essentially. Am I right about that? Yes. The way forward for us is not by accumulating religious experiences. The way forward is by keeping our conscience clear. And that means dealing with the reality of sin in our life. Can people get scrupulous? Yes, they can. Can they doubt the mercy of God? Yes, they can. And So all of that needs to be dealt with too. But to have a clear conscience before the Lord That's what we aim at in Christian prayer. With that gift of clear conscience, there's no blocks to the gifts that God wants to pour out on us. Without a clear conscience, even when he gives us gifts, we can never receive them right. It's a matter of seeking the right things. Just to reiterate or state what you've just said again, it's so important for us to seek the Lord with a pure heart, not trying to get what we want from him or results that we want or feelings or anything else, state of consciousness. It's important to seek him because he is good and he's filled with love and he wants us to thrive and he yearns for us to know him. He yearns for us to allow him to know us even more. That's just so beautiful. When I finished reading this particular section in chapter 9, it's more of a, just relax, kind of be still. It's not about not trying hard in your prayer, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, but it's, as you said, when there, those things that arise which separate me from him, sin, renounce those and turn back to him, that conversion, constantly go back to him. Don't worry about all the other other things. And she was surprised and delighted when he did favor her with special graces, but she didn't go out seeking those special graces, right? Yes, that's right. And that's the thing about God is that God always gives an abundance of gifts in prayer. Only a small fraction of them are we ever really conscious of. And he kind of hides from ourselves the gifts that he's lavished upon us. And it's much better to believe that those gifts are being lavished upon us rather than kind of being upset because this didn't happen or that didn't happen. Instead, this more humble kind of trust. My father loves me and he's pouring out gifts on me right now in this time of prayer. I'm his beloved So my job in prayer right now is just to let him love me how he wants. I don't need to worry about emotionally if I'm here or there or or anything else. I just need to be in his presence. This is a, a powerful gift if we will train ourselves into it. Are we talking about contemplative graces as well? I mean, is this essentially that quiet? He is very active in us even when we may not have an awareness. I mean, we may not be able to put our finger on it or he's just doing his work. He's just doing that act of love in us. In the broadest sense, you can call these contemplative graces. There there are mystical graces that she's going to describe later on. She's going to talk about how this prayer grows in degrees and the higher level degrees of this prayer Our effort is kind of, as it were, eclipsed by what God does. 
But by getting the fundamental disposition, human disposition right, this disposition of being actively receptive, being hospitable, welcoming the gifts that God wants to give the way he gets them and getting away from trying to pursue states or results or therapeutic ends, getting us away from that and putting us more in the relationship, this will open up all the degrees of prayer. And so she's kind of this chapter and the next chapter providing us the foundations for what that looks like. I can't wait, but I can because I'm going to sit in quiet contemplation. How's that? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Lillis. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app or on whatever platform you obtain your podcasts. There, too, you can also listen to an audio version of the complete autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.